Broadway, Broadway, in all of its glory. We all have a memory. We all have a story. Was there an understudy? Or did the show stop? Boy. Did you see Barbara before she shot to the top? Cool. Join us as we revel in our reverie. It's my Broadway memory. That jazz. I sing that theme song all week. It's stuck in my head. Hello, and welcome to My Broadway Memory. I'm Remy Germanario. Hello, and welcome to My Broadway Memory. It's I'm mine. My, it's mine. I'm Michael Kushner. And we're so excited. I was like, that's it. That's the show. Thank you very much. And we're so excited that you are uh, joining us tonight. We are ready to take a trip down memory lane, memory, Broadway memory lane. We're very excited that you're here. And we have extra special guests, Eric Lieberman and Christine Ebersole, who will be joining us in just a mo. But first, I imagine we might have uh, a few of you out there who are first time viewers. So let me tell you a little bit about my Broadway memory. My Broadway memory aims to keep Broadway alive until Broadway returns. So us and our amazing guests will discuss our favorite unheard stories and Broadway memories. Um, our main event a little later is a little bit of a show and tell section, a highlighted section where our guests could, you know, pick a playbill, you know, to discuss the memory associated with that, a piece of Broadway memorabilia, or honestly, just picking their favorite memory. It doesn't matter. It's super chill. Anything goes. Anything goes. And we know that Eric and Christine are going to have uh, some fabulous memories. So before we bring them on, we just have a very special um, update uh, about the future of My Broadway Memory, and we're really excited to share this. Yeah. So um, after tonight, we will be doing uh, these special live shows once a month. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, it was once a week and then, you know, life started to pick back up and, and, uh, and, and all of that stuff happened. So we moved to two times, uh, um, a month, you know, every other week, but now we're, we're figuring out how to bring the stories to you and how to pack a punch. And we're going to do it once, uh, once a month, make them really extra special events for you. So that being said, we will also be giving you episodes we're expanding we're going to be giving you episodes weekly audio episodes weekly that will be released wherever you download podcasts so that's exciting uh, we're thrilled for it and that's how my broadway memory is going to expand and reach so many more people and also you can get involved because we want you to share the stories and we want you to come on the podcast as well so uh you know you're probably like oh no that's probably too far apart but you know what it's uh we're so excited to be doing this for you and um we're going to continue those broadway memories absolutely and we can't announce our uh april guest for our live video show just yet but if you'd like to keep up with news about uh you know our future april guests and those audio episodes that'll be coming out in just a few weeks please give us a follow on social media um on instagram and facebook we are at my broadway memory and on twitter we are at my b-way memory um and please go subscribe to my broadway memory uh, uh wherever you listen to podcasts to stay updated on those new audio episodes. Yeah, and also um, every episode that we've had so far is uh, exists as an audio episode as well. So go subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and everything and go catch up. Uh, you can either watch or listen to all the episodes that we've done so far on My Broadway Memory. And there's going to be so many more amazing episodes, more memories, more content, and more ways for you to, for you to get involved. So um, I think that, yes, yeah, Steven says exciting. Yes. Yes, thanks, Stephen. So, Stephen, we want to hear your memories. So, what are you going to do? You're going to contact us on uh, on email or Facebook or Instagram, and we'll set up a time where you can share your Broadway memory as well. It's going to be very exciting. So, uh, let's bring in our guest. I think it's good that we do. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited for these two. Our first guest is uh, my dear friend Eric Lieberman. Uh, among his many accomplishments, Eric is a Helen Hayes award-winning actor with Broadway credits that include War Paint and Love Music. He originated the roles of Clopin, I think I said that right, in the Clopin. Hunch, Clopin, I want to do French, <laughs> uh, in the Hunchback of Notre Dame and the Telephone Guy and the Band's Visit Off-Broadway. Uh, other Off-Broadway national tour and regional credits include Merrily We Roll Along, Fiddler on the Roof, Minnie's Boys, The Calamity of Cat, Cat and Willis, and Danny Girl. Eric has also appeared in numerous film and TV credits, including the recent Transparent Musical finale. In 2020, Eric launched Bridge to Broadway, an online educational platform connecting master teachers with theater students, benefiting the Actors Fund and other charities. Oh my gosh. And our next guest, uh, even though we're meeting for the first time tonight, has been my friend, 
uh, since I saw her in Richie Rich, <laughs> which is still to this day one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, Christine Ebersole, among many award accol accolades, she is a two-time Tony Award winner for her performances in 42nd Street and Grey Gardens. Other Broadway credits include On the 20th Century, Oklahoma, Camelot, Gore Vidal's The Best Man, Steel Magnolias, Blythe Spirit, and War Paint, among others. Film TV credits include Ryan's Hope, The Cavanaugh's, Saturday Night Live, Amadeus, Valerie, Rachel Gunn, RN, Richie Rich, Tootsie, Gypsy, Will and Grace, The Wolf of Wall Street, Royal Pain, Search Party, and Bob Hart's Abishola. She also continues to enchant audiences in numerous concert halls and cabaret venues throughout the country. Without further ado, please welcome Eric Lieberman and Christine Eversole. <laughs> Hello. Well, to quote Little Edie, you both look absolutely terrific, honestly. honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here. How are you two doing? Fantastic. I'm so excited to be here. I feel the same. I mean, Christine, Remy, Michael, what could be better than that? What, what can be better than that? You know, Remy was giving us, um, you know, uh, Great Gardens just now, but I was, I was, I was thinking of a hunchback quote. I was going to say, oh my God, my nose from Richie Rich, oh but you know, I let, I let oh, him just, right? Isn't that you it? Just made, you just made his whole year. <laughs> I mean, really, I grew, I mean, like that movie is opening up that VHS, you know, I knew that that Friday night that I was going to watch Richie Rich with my family was mwah. So thank you for giving me those memories. I love that. I wanted that roller coaster. I wanted that smell master, the gift set. I wanted all of that. So, and a McDonald's in my own home. That's so right. You. In your own basement. I know. Obsessed. But um, but also, Eric, you know, we decided to move in with each other at intermission of Hunchback of Notre Dame at Paper Mill. I have been known to drive people apart and bring them together. <laughs> I'm just glad it was the latter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. So the two of you were in War Paint together, which we saw and loved. Um, were you friends prior to that or did that, no. is that where your relationship started? No. Blossomed I mean, in war paint. It, 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 it sprouted and blossomed. I fell in love with Christine the moment we, she doesn't know this, but the moment we met. And then of course her singing pink at 11 o'clock, uh, the 11 o'clock number is what I mean, just blew my mind every night. I would say it's a master class, but there was nothing academic about it. It was just sort of heart shattering. And to be with her and near her and her beautiful soul. Oh my God, the soul on this woman. And she's so funny. I'm talking about her as if she's not here. She's, so she's right there. <laughs> now that's comedy. I love it. <laughs> So oh, I adore I, you, Eric, and I'm so thrilled to be on the show with you. Oh my goodness. So I always love asking this of, of Broadway veterans like yourself, because you know, you are now part of the fabric of Broadway history, but obviously you had to start somewhere. You weren't always. So I always like to, you know, ask, what were some of your earliest memories of Broadway and theater? Like who were the performers when or shows you saw that inspired you as a young artist when you were growing up to pursue the arts and get you to where you are today? Well, I grew up in Illinois and I moved to New York when I was 20 years old. So I didn't have any, a lot of, broad, I didn't have any Broadway experience of seeing Broadway shows. You know, I came to New York when I was 20 and I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Okay. And I lived at the East End Hotel for Women, which was on 77th and East River Drive, which was $46 a week, which included two meals a day. What a steal. Well, that was, that, that was, you know, in 1916. Um, it was a long time ago, 1973. Um, but I was a waitress after I graduated in 1975. I was a waitress at the Lion's Rock. But I had gotten an agent because uh, I did a play in my senior year, <clears throat> the second year, that was called um, The Robes Heart Affair, which was about Queen Elizabeth I and her uh, supposed affair with the Keeper of the Horses. And uh, so, so I the 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 playwright was a man named Francis Letton, who was also a professor at the school. Hmm. And so he he brought when I performed it, he brought his agent Lucy Cole to the show, and uh, she decided to take me on as a client. Oh. 
So wow. I was working as a waitress at the Lions Rock. And I had in the in that fall after graduating in 1975, I I met with Shepard Traub, who was a Broadway producer and had produced a play called Angel Street in the 50s that the movie Gaslight with Ingrid Bergman was taken. Oh. It was actually Angela Lansbury's first role as the uh, Cockney maid, Nancy. And that wow. was, so I met him and I auditioned for that part of Nancy, you know, the, the maid. But that part was already filled by Christine Andreas. And so oh. it was, I think he was just kind of just seeing what was out there and everything, but he had all his ducks in a row. And, and then it was in January of 1976 when I had just come from a shift <clears throat> from working at the Lions Rock. And my agent, you know, called me on the phone. It was like 10 o'clock at night. She says, darling, you're on Broadway. That's like that. <laughs> 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 because That's like out of a movie. Andreas went and did uh, um, My Fair Lady. She got My Fair Lady with uh, Rex Harrison. Mm -hmm. She had to leave the show and they needed a replacement. So he had met me the September before and, you know, put me in the slot. So, of course, you know, I didn't have my equity card, nothing. I was a waitress. And I went to, you know, of course, went to work feeling very puffy, you know, from, from having had this uh, offer. And it was like, you know, I've got to leave you little people because <laughs> white, white way calls, you know. You start talking yeah. in a British accent. Yeah, exactly, of course, always. So um, <laughs> so the, the Shepherd Trial bought my equity card for me. I opened in the show. I mean, not opened. I mean, I replaced Christine Andreas in the show. And then three weeks later, the show closed. So I was back <laughs> oh. begging for my job. Lions <laughs> Rock, and the 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 manager Herbert, this wonderful you know irascible German guy you know took me back you know so and it was it was, it was a very humbling experience let me tell you so it was went from waiting tables to Broadway back to waiting tables for like another year and that's showbiz. Yeah, that showbiz but you know that was an amazing amazing I mean what a heady experience that was you yeah. know so you and, were saying well, that I in theater too. Wow. I love the Lyceum. I love the Lyceum. But it's so, you know, Lyceum theaters are so, I mean, I love the Lyceum and there have been great hits there, but east of Broadway, oh, wow, it's it's, tough. the court, you know, the Belasco, mm -hmm. it's, yep. it's tough. It's tough, but, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, but it, it, you can have it, you can have a hit there. I mean, you know, Hedwig really got people east of Broadway, but you know, when you're walking on Broadway, you're looking, you know, down 45th yeah. street and seeing yeah. it's, it's, it's difficult, but, um, the Lyceum is such a brilliant theater yeah. and that history yeah. there is incredible. Yeah, Mike is there in 2005. So. Oh was, yeah. Really, really to go back, you know, back to that, those memories. Anyway. That's amazing. I love that story. Eric, what about you? Uh, I was not a waitress at the Lions Rock, <laughs> uh, but I thought sure? I recognized you, Christine from somewhere. No, you I missed out. Damn it. Um, well, actually, the first Broadway show that I saw and my Broadway break are related because when I was, Perfect. I was turning 16, my father said to me, I was just a boy in short pants in my <laughs> And my father said, well, what do you want to do for your 16th birthday? I said, I want to see a Broadway show. And I want to stay at the Plaza Hotel because oh I had just seen Plaza Suite. Oh. And he, he said, oh, okay. And I didn't think much more about it. And then he showed up at our door. I was living with my mom and said, oh, we're leaving. And he, he arranged it all. And we went to Broadway and I saw uh, Cheetah Rivera in Kiss of the Spider Woman. Oh. And I was so blown away. You know, my father watched me watching the show. Mm -hmm. Afterward, he said, now I know what your life is about. <laughs> and I said, um, I'm going to work with this man, flip, 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 Harold Prince. Fast forward, uh, my singing teacher says, you know, you should enter this thing, the La Delenia competition for singers. And I said, OK. And I looked at all the past winners and they were Juilliard trained and Berklee School of Music. And I said, I, I don't think I can compete, but I can act like a person who would win this competition. <laughs> so I would rehearse six hours a day and uh, uh, and turned myself into the guy who could do it. And I showed up and Hal Prince was the judge. 
Wow. He, he came down uh, from the back of the theater and he said, I think you're terrific. You can do anything. And um, and then I got this audition for Love Music and I was way too young for it, but I kind of aged myself up a bit. And I walked in the room and he says, you know, you've aged since I saw you last. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know. And um, that was amazing. But the, the cherry on top was that years later, I got to direct Cheetah Rivera. And I got to tell her, uh, because of your devotion to your life's work, you saved my life and you gave me a lifeline. And that's the, ma and that's the magic of showbiz, kids. <laughs> You know, that's beautiful. So, you know, that makes me want to ask, like, have you had experiences where now someone brings that to you and sort of goes, you are the, you are the reason why I, uh, you know, Eric, you're working with so many incredible um, people with Bridge to Broadway. Uh, I'm uh, inspiring so many nationally, uh, internationally. What What are some interactions where you sort of gotten like, Oh my God, that's, I see myself in that person, that young artist. Very briefly, I'll just say that at Hunchback, which you all came to see, a young uh, human came up and handed me a note after the show and walked away. And inside the note, she said, uh, because of something you said, I'm not gonna kill myself. And, <sighs> and I'm coming out to my family. Oh. And I thought, holy Lord, uh, it's all those performers that I watched growing up that made me feel less alone in the world. And all of a sudden, someone tells you, you may be one of them for them. And you realize surviving is worth it, you know? That's so beautiful. I love that. Both of your stories were so touching to me and so very, so very showbiz and so very Broadway. And it really just shows you the transformative power of theater and what someone can do to make a connection with that, Let right? Christine, bring it home. She'll light the whole thing up. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna, let's hear from you too, Christine. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, uh, I got a lot of uh, comp comments and, you know, a lot of interest with doing great gardens. I think that was, uh, you know, it was such a powerful uh, piece that I think it really, um, it affected, you know, the marginalized, the, those that felt that they were marginalized. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then in a funny way, you know, I think Edie Beal, you know, gave people hope. I don't know. Yeah. But it just, it's just the way it worked. It's the story. And being able to tell the story, you know, I didn't make up the story, but I, you know, thankfully was given the opportunity to tell the story. Absolutely. And also to see those two parts of you, Christine, there was the, that abject glamour and sophistication mm -hmm. in the beginning, and then that incredible eccentricity and, and just, but never without deep humanity. Yeah. That was so moving. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even go into seeing you in that because I didn't want to, you know, blush or make you blush, but I'm bowing. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's that that's acting, you know what I mean? In other words, <laughs> I mean, that's what our job is, you know? That's our job, isn't it? Is to bring humanity to uh, whatever we do, not make a caricature of it, because you want people to be able to identify yeah. with the humanity of, of the person and what, what makes them tick in a way. Because well, at the end of the day, you don't really understand what makes them tick, you can identify with what's, you know, you can identify with their struggle. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, especially for those who know Great Gardens, the documentary, like, yes, Edie Beale could be seen by many as odd or eccentric or whatever, but at the end of the day, she was a real person with real struggles. And, and like Eric said, I, you know, I sadly did not get to see the show live, but just from, you know, performances I've seen online and, and the cast album, like, I could feel that, that you brought the humanity to, this character that many probably couldn't relate to just from that. And I, I thought it was so beautiful what you did with the role. Thank you. Uh, of course. Eric, I wanna go back to love music for one second because when we were kind of planning some stuff, I remember if, if, memory, serves, <laughs> if, mem if memory serves me correctly and it very rarely does. Uh, it's true. <laughs> don't you have a fun 
Broadway debut love music story that involves Elaine Stritch coming to see love music? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you mind sharing it? <laughs> I would not mind sharing it. So love music brought out some really polarizing opinions in people. And it was the first time, well, I learned a lot. One, many things, but one being that um, geniuses make choices that some people agree with and some people don't, and they're allowed to. And, and you as the interpreter, you didn't write the story. You're just there serving the story. But people make it a point to tell you exactly how they feel. And there were some people I'd call Uber fans of the show. Uh, I mean, more than one time, I remember Tommy Toon and Joel Gray and Zoe Caldwell and these people, Lauren Bacall, being there and just wanting to talk about it. And I'm this kid. It was my equity card. And then one day, <laughs> I'm, aware, I'm aware of this presence in the wings and we ha the curtain hasn't come down. And, and this is not a, a stage uh, hand. It's someone wearing a cream colored suit with a hat. Does anybody still wear a hat? Yes, they do. It's Elaine Stritch. <laughs> so, so, you know, the curtain comes down and she's, she's touching Donna Murphy and Michael Service and everyone as they go by and she grabs me by the lapels. Now, mind you, I've never met her. And she says, oh, I'm so mad, I'm so mad. And I was speechless and I was like, oh, well, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I, I, I said, what, what, what's upsetting you? Do, you? do you need a restroom? What is it? Oh, I'm so mad, I'm so mad. And, I, and she said, she should have sung Pirate Jenny. <laughs> And I said, oh, oh yeah, yeah. That was a choice, you know, how me, just the overture, not the song. She goes, I'm gonna go talk to Donna. <laughs> she goes into the room, you know, and everybody, everybody comes to see Donna Murphy, Michael Servers, Christy Never Solon shows. It was always a who's who. And uh, I'm coming down the stairs after I changed and there she is covered in blood. And it turned- I don't remember this part. <laughs> oh, oh I, this is part B. This is only from my Broadway memory. Oh, wow. Uh, bless her. She went in and, and she was a known diabetic and she had to give herself an injection in Donna's oh. room and it got on her suit. But oh, no. her white suit. Yes, her, her cream colored, beautiful suit. But, you know, in some strange way, that's just endemic to Elaine Stritch because she was a blood and guts performer. You right. know, she was, she was not someone who polished away the human. And, and that's why she was just so, now, now I'm sorry, I don't want to hog, but I'll just say years before this, the first movie that I was ever in as an extra, Elaine Stritch was in it, along with Gwen Verdon, Maureen Stapleton, who put me in it, Wilfred Brimley, uh, Jessica Tandy, it was Cocoon the Return. And I remember when I saw the movie and Elaine was in it, she was in a gravity, hoist with her breast shaking and, and screaming in that smoky voice. And I thought, this is an incredible human. I had no idea. I had no idea, but to when I heard company, I got it. Anyway. Uh, that mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was thinking about asking you that question, I, I don't remember the full story before I wanted to ask, but I just remember, oh, I'm so mad. I, I just remember seeing you do that. Um, Christine, were there any in, in your amazing Broadway career where who who were, who was someone who came to visit the show? Maybe who you, who you got a little maybe not starstruck over, but you were you you or, felt that you were in the presence or of made an impression. <laughs> well, the first person that comes to mind is when I was doing uh, on when I was a regular cast member of Saturday Night Live. Um, it was Johnny Cash. Oh wow, <laughs> cool! That's um, was he? I was, was starstruck. He, was he the musical guest? Yeah, he was the musical wow. guest. Yeah. And I hope he was lovely. He was the musical guest and the regular guest. And, and, and okay. he did both, you know. I hope he was lovely. Oh. Okay, good. Heaven, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was starstruck. And uh, I got his autograph. Amazing. That's cool. and that's I never amazing. asked really, I never really did that, you know, ask people for autographs, but he's the one that I did. 
There's those people, though, that yeah. you're like, you know, you... I feel like people appreciate it, especially like when they can tell that you're not normally the person that does this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they know it's special. I have to say, Christine, that that Tootsie is the movie that made me want to act. And of course, you were in that. And I remember being in the wings. Yeah, I remember in the wings asking you about that scene with Dustin Hoffman. And um, I think that there was a revelation you talked about on Bridge to Broadway having to do with even someone like Dustin Hoffman, who just won an Oscar, having his insecurities and uh, how it sort of doesn't end. But um, yeah, man, you realize it's an inside job, you know, because he was telling me, uh, you know, he was going to meet the Queen of England and he had, was up for an, an Oscar um, or the movie, that movie he did with Meryl Streep, what was it? Kramer versus Kramer. Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah. And um, he was, I was in with him on the, you know, the, the makeup test. So I did a, like a whole day of uh, improv improvisation with him. Um, and, and then we went to the dailies afterwards to look at, you know, how he looked in women's makeup. And uh, he just was like, I can't do this. He's saying to me, I can't do this. Can't do this. And I'm thinking, you're Dustin Hoffman. You just you just got like an Oscar. You gotta like what, what do you mean you can't? And, I, and I'm sitting there going, you've got to do this. This is what I'm, I'm thinking, what am I giving you? I'm giving Dustin Hoffman a pep talk. It was so crazy. I mean, I just didn't expect that it would be coming from him. But then it made me realize I thought, oh yeah, like I was saying to you, Eric, it's it's really an inside job. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter how many accolades you have or how many awards you have. It's really kind of, you know, your relationship to to your craft, you know, and and what you you know feel about it, you know. Yeah, I, you know, my godmother's an actress, and she has a very funny, high pitched voice. She uh, Joyce Boulafont. She used to be on Mary Tyler Moore and oh, and uh, other shows. And she, she told me this story about being at the Coconut Grove and seeing, I think it was the Coconut Grove. She was with Bobby Darren and Sandra D. And they heard this young singer, Barbara Streisand, sing. And Joyce was, oh. dating, yeah, Joyce was dating James MacArthur at the time, the former, the future Hawaii Five O actor, yeah. mm -hmm. Helen Hayes' son. Yeah. And Barbara comes and says, you know, I've been offered this role. I don't know if I should do it. It's called Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Joyce is like, oh, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. And by the time Joyce went to see her backstage in Funny Girl, it was like they never had the chat. But uh. <laughs> we all <laughs> pep talks. Christine, you gave me a fair share of pep talks on War Pain, and I'll always be grateful for that. Oh, thanks. Nothing like a, nothing like a good pep talk. I, I feel like we give each other pep talks every morning just to m decide who's going to walk the puppy. But, you know, everyone everyone has their own. Um, yeah, absolutely. So before we get into um, the uh, show and tell section, or if, if you have, you know, a playbill or a prop or, or just the memory, um, we have actually some fan questions for you. So um, these were vetted. These were selected through a very, very intense selection process. Very structured. So uh, this one is for Eric, and this one is from Josh R. from Austin, Texas. And Josh wants to know, what advice do you have for artists struggling to be creative during this time? Oh, what a great question. Thanks for asking, Josh. Um, I really love a book called The Artist's Way, and I've been recommending it a lot this week. But it has to do with um, just making uh, peace and getting acquainted with that artist who lives inside you and, and gathering a writing practice. I think writing is so important, especially for actors. Mm -hmm. And um, I think within every actor, there's a great story that wants to be told that either gets told through the characters they're hired to play or the character that they write for themselves to play. So I encourage you to dive into writing actually and take advantage of a lot of great Zoom classes, you know? Many of the great teachers in the world who can't meet with you in a theater are meeting online. So if you can't take, at least audit and remain inspired. Um, I, that's what I've been doing. I love that. That's and I, I have to piggyback on that. The Artist Way is it's a great. awesome. Artist State have, have been so wonderful. Morning Pages. 
you know. Yes, uh, one more book is called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Fantastic book. And Big Magic is another great book I recommend a lot. Love yes. the war of art because we are or, or warriors, especially now as we're trying to survive and create and still, you know, progress our careers and, you know, all and, and survive. <laughs> and, you know, so we are warriors and war, the war of art is an incredible book that I, I very much love. So yes, take those into consideration and, and, and check those out from your library. I need to read it. Our next fan question from our Instagram is for Christine. We sort of touched on Grey Gardens a little bit already, but uh, Valerie from Ocala maybe wants you to just go a little bit further. She said, you said in your Tony speech that Edie was the role of a lifetime. What research or preparation did you do to embody that role? Well, interestingly, I was, I became obsessed with the documentary about a year and a half before I, I was even asked to do the role. Oh, wow. So it was almost like God was, you know, preparing me for this. Um, I was at a friend's in, in LA and I was out there doing a TV series that kind of never got launched, but uh, I had a lot of free time. And he said to me, did you, have you ever seen, you know, the, the documentary Grey Gardens? Because I had just bought a new DVD player back in those days, you know. Mm -hmm. You did. Hard to come by now. It's and, true. And um, I know. So um, he said, oh, you got to see Great Gardens. And I said, well, you know, I remember hearing about it, but I, I haven't seen it. So I went and rented it with a bunch of other, you know, DVDs. And I never saw any of the other DVDs. I, I, I put it in the player and it was literally like breakfast, lunch and dinner. I could not uh. get enough of it. I was completely obsessed with these two women and... You know, I never thought to myself, gee, this will make a great musical, you know? <laughs> I was going to ask that. You know? But I think as an actor, you know, you're always, um, you know, wanting to find out, you know, get inside and find out what makes a person tick. And and that, that was what was, you know, so extraordinary to me was to think that these women who, quote unquote, had it all, you know, they had everything and in, in terms of the conventional secular world that we look at and go, oh, my gosh, they had fame, they had you know, wealth, you know, they had you know riches, they had, blah, 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 they had everything. And in a way, they were birds in a gilded cage. And, it, yeah. and you know, ironically, it wasn't until their house was like in total disrepair and it was, a, you know, the rubble that their authentic selves could rise above it. You know, that's what was so interesting and they could they were free to be themselves in the rubble you know but in these in this society that they were born into they had no choice they were born yeah. into it and these things were forbidden you know you couldn't you couldn't be an actor you couldn't be a singer you couldn't be you know so she would big Edie was relegated to performing for tea parties and things like that so uh that's what just was it was just very compelling to me and then when I got yeah. the chance to do it, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing that this is happening to me. And that I had prepared. I was ready to do it. I was yeah. ready to totally walk into it. And it was really I, just from watching the DVD. And yeah. of afterwards, you know, you start to read stories and, you know, they have all the, these things that when we were at Sundance and doing the workshop, they had only had done act one. They hadn't even done act two. Mm. And um you know, it, they, they'd give you like stacks of things to read about it. Um, and then, you, of course, you find out other things. But it was really basically the character study of watching the documentary. Did the did her voice and her mannerisms just come kind of naturally to you when you started kind of doing it? Or did that well, take some work? It was almost like a channeling in a way. You know? Yeah. Because I don't really understand it. I don't, I don't really understand how it is, but it's like I, there was obviously some identification with, uh, I mean, a huge identification with, with these characters so that playing them, it wasn't really an intellectual endeavor. It was just more of a, um, you know, like from the heart. I don't know how, I mean, I really, yeah. hard to really explain it, you know? I get that. That's, that's sort of how I approach work a lot too. It's just, you feel it. It's especially yeah, it's with Rose. It's almost like, you know, you step into, you step into the bus, you're driving the bus, but you're not the bus. You know what I mean? You, you know yeah. What I mean? It's like, you just, you, cause you have to drive it. 
when you're performing it, you have to drive it and direct it, you know, where it's going, but it's something bigger than you mm -hmm. that you're, that you're inhabiting, you know? I feel like with these, with these, you know, you also played another iconic woman in war paint, you're playing historical women. And I feel like these wonderful, fabulous, brassy personalities, if we were to like try to emulate them, if we were like try to act as them, that's when it would get characteristic. But because you were living so honestly in the truth of the given circumstance and, you know, I, I feel like that that's what made it so honest and that's what made it so well, iconic. It's also interesting too, because, you know, the act two was really from the documentary. So yes. it was very representational, but I think then in act one, it was more presentation. It was more out of my imagination. Yeah. You know, whereas the, whereas act two was more absorbing you know the actual characteristics of the person because you know how the way she stood the way she mm -hmm. you know, moved her moved her body the i mean just all of that it wasn't it, it wasn't coming out of my imagination it was coming from absorbing what i saw visually yeah character yeah Oh, I loved the way you put all that. Yeah. That made me, you it's know, beautiful. I've, I've seen the documentary so many times and even just hearing you say just the ways you approached it, it I, I just had never thought about it in that way before. That's wonderful. And I think that that's yeah. why you were so iconic in it. kind of supernatural um, uh, experience because I don't, like I say, I don't really understand it, but it was like, it was it was something I want to say take over because you're still, like I say, you're driving the bus, you know, you're yeah. driving it, but you're there, yet there was something that, that I allowed, you know, through memory, through, you know, through all these, like the five senses to inhabit me. I love that. I love that. You mentioned um, Supernatural. Now, I have a fan question for the both of you. Sorry, I'm interjecting. I'm going rogue. Have the two of you ever experienced a Supernatural experience backstage in your dressing room? Did anyone ever historically visit you? Um, anyone? Did anyone? Because, you know, Patty has that incredible experience of backstage of Evita and Ava Perone visited her. The light bulb flashed or it broke or, or something like that. But And I, I love stories like this. So have you ever been visited by someone in a, a, a ghost inhabiting the theater or uh, has that ever happened to you both? Well, I'll, uh, n not in the way you describe it. I, I'm going to first borrow from what Christine just said and say that when, when it gets going well and you do feel something take over, whether you call it muse or the synergy of the spheres or whatever it is, that to me feels supernatural or otherworldly. Mm -hmm. The other thing that comes through the side door of your question is when someone who knew your character, uh, for, we were just talking about war paint. So, you know, I read and read and read about Charles Revson, the guy I was playing, mm -hmm. and there's no, like no video footage of him. I wrote to his children. I, he, he thought wow. he was a very ugly man. And he did not like to be photographed. He just liked to make mm. women beautiful. And so I really had no idea how he talked or how he walked, but I was absorbing, as Christine described, from the literature. And then a man comes up to me at the stage door and says, uh, I worked for him. How did you know how he talked and walked and moved and treated people? And I said, that's him because I think we wow. walk ourselves to that precipice and then hopefully something larger takes over. But no, I've not seen Bob Fosse in the theater lately. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Except for that. <laughs> oh my Amazing. gosh. Well, thank you to everyone who asked a question. I thought that brought up some incredible conversation. Seriously, we will always take fan questions for future guests. So please keep those questions coming. Um, so for Eric and Christine, we're gonna take a wee little commercial tiny. break, just a t tiny one. And then tiny. we'll come in for the final little section of our show uh, because we we have some exciting news to share on behalf of Broadway Podcast Network. Drum roll. Yes, drum roll. Broadway Podcast Network now has an app. 
It's yes. very exciting. Yes, an app now available for iPhone and iPad. So Broadway Podcast Network features over 100 podcasts, live events, audio dramas, <laughs> cast reunions, and endless conversations with the top theater artists of our day. Uh, recent podcast guests and BPN show stars include the Ratatouille musical creative team, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Glenn Close, Sutton Foster, Ariana DeBose, Ramin Karamloo, uh, and so many more. You can find them all inside Broadway Podcast Network iOS app, including past episodes of my Broadway memory with such guests as Mary Testa, Jackie Hoffman, Leslie Kritzer, Colleen Ballinger, Todra Call, Mark Shaman, uh, and now Christine and Eric and so many more. Yes, also my my very professional podcast, Your Multi Hyphen, it oh, yes, is also course. on VPN and Eric is also going to be a guest soon. I'm very excited for us to do that. But um, provocative stories of all kinds are the cornerstone of the Broadway Podcast Network, presenting original, engaging, and immersive programming of theater and theater adjacent podcasts, audio dramas, serials, parodies, live video events, and more. With tremendously talented hosts who are performers, producers, writers, industry leaders, and storytellers representing a wide variety of voices and perspectives. BPN offers entertaining, inspiring, easily accessible, and shareable content for everyone. May they be interested in behind-the-curtain access to the creative process, advice on everything from how to break into the business and how to um, and how to audition, theater history, candid interviews with their favorite stars, or just enjoying theater from the best seats in the house. So be sure to download the BPN app today. Yes, awesome. Oh Michael, I think I'm going to put a BA after my name, but it's not Bachelor of Arts. It's Broadway adjacent. Broadway adjacent. I like Broadway adjacent. Please welcome to the stage, Broadway adjacent. Oh my God. That's funny. That's good. So Christine and Eric, now we're going to kind of go to, to our, our little final section of the night, uh, which is our quote unquote show and tell uh, section. So my Broadway memory started le at the start of the pandemic. Michael started to kind of pull playbills from his collection at random on his Instagram and kind of just talk about the memory associated with that playbill. Um, it's sort of evolved from picking a playbill at random. It could be anything. It could just be another memory. We've talked about so many already. I'll go first, though, as a little uh, icebreaker. Um, so I normally, when it's my turn, we alternate. I, I normally do try the playbill at random situation just to, you know. We have, so we have all, I mean, I have all, it's all in our bookshelf over there. So we might as well put them to use. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But I wanted to be a little bit more strategic with what I picked tonight since the two of you are on. And I picked something very topical and I picked Yay! a war paint. Now here's my Broadway memory of war paint. So I, uh, this was a fun day. So I have lived in New York for 13 years. And one of my favorite things to do is go to see theater by myself. I love seeing theater alone. I think it's very liberating and so fun. And this was a very special day because I had a two show day. So War Paint was uh, the evening show and Groundhog Day was the matinee show. So I saw you two second. I was of course very excited to see uh, my friend Eric and I was so happy uh, to see you nailing it on a Broadway stage. But something I was very excited for as well, when I see a Broadway show, I love watching and hearing entrance applause mm. for Broadway stars. It gives me chills every time. I think it's so cool. I'm getting it, we're getting them right now. I love entrance applause in a Broadway theater. And I'm going into this and I'm like, okay, it's Patti Lapone and Christine Ebersole. Obviously they're gonna have their own big entrance and it's gonna be something. I just, I didn't know what it was gonna be, but I was so excited for it. And you two- uh, Didn't disappoint. Did not disappoint. <laughs> I, I talk about it several times a year at this point now. So yours was so fun, of course, it, you know, if you're if you're watching and you don't know it because Yours is kind of the bigger the bigger opening number and all the girls are like, she's coming, she's coming, she's coming, she's coming. And then at the, the grand, yeah. it's just like luxurious, she's here at the top of the staircase. I thought it was fabulous and the entrance applause. And then of course, Patty's was very Patty. You know, it's so I'm gonna be back in Manhattan. In Manhattan. Uh, <laughs> And the entrance applause. I think it was it was both per it was just perfect uh, entrance applause yeah. moments for not only Christine and Patty but for uh, Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein. Yes. I had a great time uh, at the show. He went by himself. I went with Ben Rimmelauer. I'm not sure if you. Oh, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. we know Ben. Uh, that was, he was my date. Yeah. Eric, you were going to say something? Christine, do you remember in Chicago when the show was at the Goodman and you had sort of double first entrance? A woman's face. Right. 
And then they took it out because the audience didn't know where to to bring that thunderous applause on. But there was a there's a cut song from Chicago that was equally beautiful. I mean, when you look at the people who wrote the show and Great Gardens, it's just an embarrassment of riches. I love that entrance, but backstage was crazy because I think I was doing a quick change trying to get ready for you, and it was insane, but so amazing to feel that love radiating yeah. up for you. It must feel so good and 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 just delicious walking down this that staircase during that song. Uh. Yes, and you're just praying you don't fall. <laughs> Every day I pray that. So <laughs> So that's the the gist of of uh, the little show and tell section. Uh, do I have an, any volunteers, Eric? I know you maybe had. Do you maybe have something? I do, but I would like to offer the slot to Christine to begin. If you would like to share something, Christine. Well, I don't. You know, like I say, I've got all of my. I don't really uh, save playbills. I more save tickets. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I don't have any tickets with me because, you know. I'm in Hollywood, so not in New Jersey and all my stuff is there. But I would just say, you know, one of the great memorable uh, theatrical experiences that I had of late was seeing um, Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. Oh. At the Jewish you know, Heritage Theater mm -hmm. that, that uh, Joel Gray directed. Mm -hmm. And I was really kind of surprised at my reaction to it. You know, I, you know, I didn't expect it. I didn't understand, of course, anything it was in Yiddish. And they had like, you know, English supertitles and Russian supertitles. But I literally, afterwards of meeting the cast afterwards, I literally couldn't speak. It had, it was, it was such a heart experience. And it just spoke to like, you know, the history of humanity and it was just like I was, I, I was so embarrassed because I was such a blithering idiot. It was like, I guess. <laughs> it was like, what did she say? You know, <laughs> it was really bad. You but should have just said you were speaking Yiddish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and just you know, Joel Gray's direction was just, oh my god, this, this, just this like lesson in simplicity. I mean, it was like. There was like six chairs and a, and a table and a car. I mean, that was it. You know, it was it was it was so profound and so moving and and such an incredible experience. I'll never forget. You know, the sec I saw it twice actually. Oh wow! And after it, it was at you know downtown. Then I think it moved to the Schubert. I think it was still playing when um, you know yeah. when everything shut down. Did you guys see it? I did. I, did. I didn't get to. I'm sad. Yeah. I don't and know, you know experience, but it was it was so it was so powerful. I thought, you know, I'm I'm Jewish, and you know, I I I do know some Yiddish, and I try to pick my grandma's brain every time I can, you know, just to get those phrases, just to get you know, uh, you know, get cocking off and yum, and you know, which is, well, I'll tell you after the show, okay. and uh, no, I won't, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so uh, it was extremely meaningful to see, you know, Yiddish is a dying language and it's so expressive, it's so musical. And mm -hmm. to see an American musical be stripped down and then put with this, this sort of archaic language on top. It's not even that, it's like, it's, it like goes back to like the core of what it was. It you was know, like amazing. You're, you're there from the, you know, it's like you're back there, you know? It was incredible. It, it was original state, you know? felt right. Yeah. Amazing. And, it's, it's just the, and just the power of family. That's the thing. Yeah. It transcends yeah. all cultures, everything. It's family. And the importance and the power of family. It, that that's that's really what you know struck me. I love that. I only was, heard good things about that show. Amazing. It was amazing. It was it so really good. was. It really was. My grandparents who came from those shtetls used to say, um, oh, you're gonna be an actor. I hope you do Fiddler on the Roof. And I never I never watched it uh, until I got hired to do it with Tobel. Yeah. And then Harvey and Theo Bakel came in. And it was so amazing because my grandparents were gone. Mm -hmm. Ghosts. I felt my grandfather every night oh. during the exile. And uh, people would come, 
massive response for Topol because of the popularity of the film. Mm -hmm. And then we'd get people from Japan and Africa and everywhere saying, well, this is about my family. Uh, so that was an exceptional thing. But that's not my theater story, but I, they can be if we're out of time. No, <laughs> no we're not. Fine. No. What are, right, so, so this is, this is a crazy story that does involve that full circle thing we touched on earlier. So when I was a student at the National Theater in London, uh, there was a show called Amy's View and an actress in it named Judy Dench. And I'd never heard of her. You know, she had not been popular in American film at that point. And I couldn't believe what she manifested on that stage. In the last scene, uh, she's staring through a, a makeup mirror, but it's not there. It's just the fourth wall. And it's like the effect of a cinematic close up happened in a theater. Wow. There was intimacy. I couldn't get out of my seat. And I wrote her and she called me. And so for 23 years, we've been pen pals and the like. Wow. And I never got a program from the show. And when I was in New York, uh, the, the other job that I did between acting was I was a professional organizer. So I helped people clear out their homes and, and off, sometimes when somebody died, I was hired to liquidate the estate. And it was like a great archeological dig every time. And one day I was thinking, oh God, you know, why am I doing this? I'm not an actor. You know, I felt really bad. And they, I was cleaning up a dead woman's estate. And I said, please, you know, give me a sign that I should do this. And this program <gasps> you, appears under a massive rubble. This is when the show was at Broadway. And I said, okay, I stay. And then, um, and then I, found, I took this off the bookshelf, which was me and Jude, when Aww. I went to see her in Winter's Tale. And just the other day, uh, she sends a bottle of, this is so silly, she sends a bottle of champagne just to say, keep your spirits up in the middle of all of this. Now, what's crazy to me about that is part of what the mission of your program is, I think, is that when someone who doesn't have the time or, or any real reason to, to say I believe in you or keep going or I see who you are, but chooses to do that. The effect is extraordinary and can not only last your lifetime, but the lifetime of the person who benefits from your having been endowed with that spirit of paying it forward. Mm. So that's why I love theater because inevitably this fabric just gets closer and closer. We meet each other, we help each other. And um, I, I liken it to a, a, you know, a grove of trees that keep growing and providing shade and safety for those who come under them. And uh, not to wax poetical, but I done did. Uh, that's my theater story. <laughs> that's beautiful. <laughs> story. And, and to even tie it into Christine's story, you know, the, the Yiddish word for that is beshert. Yeah. Meant to be. Yes. There you go. Isn't that a beautiful word? Yeah. I love it. That is, um, that's an amazing story. Y'all, this that's has been great. one of my favorite episodes as far as like, just like beautiful, like yeah. meaningful things. So yes. thank you so, so much for your insight, both of you, your incredible stories, your incredible wisdom, and just like for hopping on and having a good time. And I'm, I'm glad that we could reunite the two of you. I know. Uh, yeah. You know, for a little bit. Um, well, unfortunately though. Oh wait, go, go, go. Oh, I was just gonna say, when I came to LA three years ago to work on a project, Christine was here and was doing Candide at the opera. Oh. And we were lucky enough to go to Huntington Gardens together, which is this glorious botanical garden. And when you're living the show life, you sort of clock in, clock out, you see each other, you do the thing and you go away, you meet in the ice skating rink. But it's such <laughs> a pleasure to realize when uh, that amazing talent that you've worked with is also an exquisite human being. And I dare say, friend, that's the most touching thing of all. So i that's the best I take out. That's the best Broadway memory I got out of Warpaint was Christine. Aww. Aww. Love you. 
Let's go back to Huntington Gardens together. I'm game. Okay. <laughs> it's a date. For Take a we selfie a and date. yes, we love that. Yeah. Um, and we'll we'll hop on a plane and join you. So if you see <laughs> us there, just you we're know, just like stalking and we're just like, hi guys. Wow, it's crazy that we're all here together, it's huh? Weird. <laughs> it's so weird. Um, you you both are incredible. You're both amazing. So um, thank you for everyone that watched today. Uh, remember, our live shows will be back in April, and we'll be releasing those expanded audio episodes starting in a, um, a few weeks, and we want you to be a part of them. So if you have a Broadway memory that you want to share, uh, please reach out to us. We want more memories. We want more content to bring back to you, and we want more ways for us all to be involved together. Once again, to stay updated, uh, please follow my Broadway memory on social media for more updates. You can also follow me at Remy Germanario and Michael at the Michael Kushner. And don't forget to follow our two fabulous guests uh, at Christine Ebersole underscore official and at Eric Lieberman. Um, let's, before we go, uh, let's take a, a group picture. Um, so what we're going to do is I think we're going to, I think we're going to smell the flowers at the botanical garden. Okay. Mm. So we want just like beautiful, just ready. I'm going to count down from three and we're going to do a lovely, lovely wafting mm. of this flowers. Ready? Three, two, one. Mm. <sighs> wow. you Perfect. Know, you know what we were doing in that photo? We were driving the bus. But, yes! uh, right. <laughs> yeah. There we go. We love it. Oh my goodness. This was incredible. Thank you so much to Eric Lieberman, Broadway legend, Christine Ebersole, co-creator Brian Sedita, uh, Josh Freilich for composing our theme song and Laura Bonacci for our theme song graphics. We'd also like to thank everyone at Broadway Podcast Network, Alan, Dory, Britt, Katie, Yo. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>